for joining us uh, on this uh, special event called Directing Finance Towards Climate Change Adaptation. Uh, we're coming to you live from COP26 in Glasgow, most of us anyway. It's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you to this event. It's organized by the European uh, Investment Bank and the European Court of Auditors. Now, we all know too well that Europe is no safe haven from climate change. The events of last summer, extreme flooding, wildfires, and record-breaking heat waves across the continent were a tragic reminder that Europe, and of course the whole world, needs to do more to prepare for and adapt to the accelerating impacts of climate change. But despite progress in adaptation planning across the EU, investment in adaptation remains very low. And these are some of the themes we're going to be addressing in today's discussion on what is required to direct greater finance to climate change adaptation in the EU. Let me, without further ado, introduce you to our panel, um, the co-hosts of today's event, first of all, um, EIB Vice President Amboise Fayol, and we also have member of the European Court of Auditors, Eva Lindstrom. Um, Eva, thanks very much for joining us uh, from the Court of Auditors uh, as well. Thank you for convening this important discussion, also for your report, which uh, reminds us that the issue of adaptation is high on everybody's agenda. Um, I'm also very glad to welcome Hans Brunigs, who is the Executive Director of the European Environmental Agency, Environment Agency, sorry Hans, got that right. And uh, in a moment, we'll also be joined by Henk Ovink, who's the Special Envoy for International Water Affairs for the Netherlands. Now, we're going to be uh, taking questions from you online, uh, and I'd like to remind you that um, for those of you joining uh, via the, the digital hub, the Benelux CIB digital hub, you can put your questions in the chat, and we'll come to those in a little while. Um, but first, I want to turn to Vice President uh, Amboise Fayol from the European in Investment Bank, who's responsible both for climate and development. Just Give us some sense of why directing finance to climate change adaptation is such a key topic for the EIB. Over to you, Vice President. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shirin, and uh, good, uh, good afternoon to, uh, to all our, uh, our viewers uh, and uh, uh, a special, uh, special thank to, uh, to uh, Ms. Lindstrom uh, for being here and uh, hello to, uh, to Hans Breining that uh, I have met in uh, but must in uh, in Glasgow uh, in Glasgow this week. Um, I I would start by saying two things. One, um, adaptation has become a very important issue, not only actually for developing countries, very important for developing countries clearly. But what we have seen in uh, Europe this uh, summer shows that this has become an issue that is an issue more and more important to deal with uh, for European economies. And uh, the, you know, the events that were every 50 years that turned to be every 10 years that turned to be mostly uh, more or less every, every year. Uh, this is the, the recognition that uh, climate change has already happened and that we need to include adaptation in what we do to try to mitigate the, the climate change and to reduce CO2 emissions. The two things that were very important for us, in, in, we have made big announcements in Glasgow, in Glasgow about our first adaptation strategy. Uh, we are a big institution in terms of financing of climate issue. We are not a big institution in terms of financing adaptation, but we recognize that this is something that we need to do much more. And actually we have presented in Glasgow a strategy that, uh, that relies on two, uh, on two important elements. But the first one is the European strategy that has been uh, published in, in the spring. And the second one is uh, our own evaluation department has made an evaluation uh, on adaptation that is extremely interesting and that is the basis also of uh, in the recommendation what we should do to, uh, to increase our, uh, our share of adaptation. So, in, in a nutshell, uh, what we have proposed is three things. One, our, our, our ambition is to increase a lot the volume of what we do in adaptation. 
we are going to triple the volume of adaptation projects by 2025. And that means that at that time, it will represent around 15% of what we do in climate action. That is in all the geographies where, where we are active. So in uh, Europe and outside of Europe, especially Africa is a key uh, target for us. The second thing that we are proposing in, uh, in, uh, in, in, our, um, in, uh, in our strategy is a support, not only financial, but also in terms of capacity knowledge, technical assistance, capacity building, uh, in what we call a one-stop shop. So you come and we, you will be told how we can help and where you can find support from us in um, a platform that is called ADAPT. The ADAPT platform of EIB will help us do more on, on, on financing uh, adaptation. And finally, what we intend to do also is we recognize that there is a specific challenge for least developing countries and for small development island states where there is a justification where normally we don't finance more than 50% of a project. In these geographies, we would finance much more between basically 75 and 100% of adaptation projects in those, in those geographies. And we think this is clearly the role of a public, uh, a public bank, and we are a public bank to do that. So I'll stop there. But basically, the, the key principle is the recognition that adaptation is essential to achieve the targets that we have in terms of, uh, of, of climate, uh, climate targets. And that what we are going to do is do much more projects and probably to combine also much more an adaptation angle when we look at a project for mitigation. Thank you very much, Vice President, uh, for framing the EIB's intention there. Um, important uh, reminder, yes, of the evaluation report as well that our team did, did. I mean, the EIB has this independent evaluation function as well, which uh, for those of you joining online, uh, we can share that evaluation report uh, for those of you who are interested. Let me now um, turn to uh, Ms. Lindstrom. Um, the European Court of Auditors recently completed a special report on sustainable finance. Um, would you perhaps guide us through some of the key messages of that report um, with a particular focus on climate change adaptation. Over to yes, you. thank you very much, Shirin, and good afternoon, everyone. And also let me start by thanking you, Mr. Vice President, and your, all your colleagues at the EIB for organizing this event together with us. Actually, I think this is the first time that we share an event together at the COP, and I think the idea for this was actually the, the outcome of our sustainable finance uh, audit, which I'm going to present here. And I think also we work very well together. We have a very good cooperation, but of course we are naturally on the different sides of the table. So we have prepared a short uh, slide presentation or a PowerPoint presentation, so I would ask my... my uh, Andre to, to, to help me to share this. So first, uh, the European Court of Auditor, or short EACA, is we are the EU's independent external auditor and climate change is one of our top priorities. And we have produced actually several reports on this topic, including on climate adaptation. However, this was the first report on sustainable finance. Mind the investment gap. Well, we know that in order to achieve the 2050 net zero emission target, experts estimate that we need to spend almost 1 trillion euros investment each year. And this does actually not include the cost of adaptation to climate change, uh, which is even more difficult to determine. Clearly, we will need private and institutional capital to close this gap. So our main audit question was, whether the EU has been taking the right action to redirect finance towards sustainable investment. And we focused on three different areas. Firstly, of course, we looked at the commissions and also the legislature's action. Secondly, we looked at the role of the European Investment Bank. And thirdly, we also examined the EU's budget if it is following sustainable finance good practice. 
Just let me mention our sort of starting point and the reasons behind the lack of sustainable investment. And I think it's fair to say that sustainability has become a bit of a buzzword and many claim to be taking steps towards transforming their companies or businesses into more sustainable ones. But we also know that capital continues to flow towards unsustainable activities. And to put it simply, unsustainable activities are still too profitable. And we have what we economists call different market failures. Firstly, the product we buy today and the price we pay for investment do not reflect the cost and impact they have on society and environment. Second, there is currently not enough transparency and disclosure on what is actually sustainable and what is not. And thirdly, investing in sustainable investment can have a high risk or additional challenges, uh, such in the case of adaptation projects, which may large amounts of upfront finance and, and that also may also have a lack of steady stream of, of revenue. And finally, experts we talk to or investors we talk to ask, so where are the projects we can invest in? Please show us the list pointing to a lack of sort of information on investment needs and also available mitigation and adaptation projects. So this was an important starting point. Now let's turn to our findings. First on the Commission's action plan. Our audit shows that the Commission rightly focused on making transparent what is sustainable and what is not. And the key measure here is of course the recent EU taxonomy with this do no significant harm principle as well as detailed criteria. But this has not yet been accompanied by measures to fully address the cost of unsustainable economic activities. And the EU's action on sustainable finance, that is what we say in the report, will not be fully effective unless additional measures are taken to price in the environmental and social costs of unsustainable activities. And for example, the cost of greenhouse gas emission is still not fully reflected in the business decisions. And looking at the action plan, we can also see that many EU actions are, are, are also suffered delays. When it comes to the EU budget, uh, approximately 30% is planned for climate action. Uh, we do not know how much will go to adaptation. We found that the EU budget still lacks consistent science-based criteria to avoid significant harm to the environment. And it does not consistently apply the do not significant harm principle to all EU expenditure. In practice, this means that EU still can fund harmful activities. And it also means that there is no consistency whether projects have to take adaptation into account. Coming now to, to the EIB, uh, in our report, we highlight the very important role that the EIB have, has when it comes to supporting sustainable finance. And I think in addition to all the financing that the EIB do to different sustainable event, uh, investment projects, the bank also have an extremely important role to do the due diligence to check environmental and social aspects of project projects. So others investors are willing also to go into this investment. And I think to put it simple, this sort of reduces the transaction cost for other investors. And we also know that the EIB plans to apply the EU taxonomy. More on the findings from the EIB. Well, our findings shows, and we already touched upon this, uh, that the focus of this uh, FC investment was not where sustainable investment is most needed. We found few climate action projects being carried out in central in Eastern Europe, where experts see the biggest needs. This is where we should get the most bang for the buck. <laughs> and only around, around 5% went to this region. Also, we found that most financing went to mitigation projects and only little, uh, went uh, less than 4% went to climate change adaptation projects. Of course, and I mean, we fully see that there might be challenges for finding sort of the right business model for climate adaptation projects. So I think for me, it was very interesting to, to hear more on, on EIB's adaptation plan. So now coming to the conclusions and our recommendations, we conclude that in order to redirect private and public finance towards sustainable investment, more consistent EU action is required. And our main recommendation for the Commission were to take a more proactive approach to sustainable project development, including adaptation projects. 
and the Commission should focus its new advisory services, such as the InvestEU Advisory Hub, to areas and sectors with high sustainable investment needs, but where we also see low capacity to mount such projects. The second recommendation is uh, to complete the measures of the action plan. Our third recommendation is to identify additional measures to ensure that the pricing of greenhouse gas emissions better reflect their environmental cost. And we know that as part of the Fit for 55 package, the Commission proposed to extend the ETS to road transport and building sectors and also more tight rules for aviation. And the Commission has also proposed a carbon border adjustment mechanism. I think these are really important measures, uh, and but I think one should also remember that at the moment there are just proposals on the table. And finally, regarding the EU budget, we recommend a more consistent application of the do no significant harm principle and the EU taxonomy criteria. For example, we found that how member states will apply this principle in the EU's recovery fund, that will vary. And it will also be interesting to discuss here, of course, the potential of the EU's recovery fund for adaptation projects. So that was in short our report our conclusions and recommendation and I will stop here and thank you very much for your attention and I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Eva Lindstrom uh, from the uh, European Court of Auditors. Uh, thank you for the insight into your report and, and some of your recommendations which perhaps we can discuss uh, in a little bit of detail uh, in a moment. But first, um, may I ask you, Hans Brüning, uh, from the uh, European Environment Agency, what's your take um, on what's required, particularly in the area of investment in adaptation uh, in Europe? What is the EEA doing to support this shift? Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you to uh, Mr. Fayol and uh, Mrs. Lindstrom for uh, the introduction, I think it sets the scene also for my brief intervention. I think a first element is to translate the rather generic concept of adaptation into more concrete challenges uh, that uh, require potential solutions that then require investment. And there is quite a bit of work that needs to be done. And the agency has done work on uh, adaptation in the mobility system, in the energy system, in infrastructure, in the urban setting, in the health uh, debate, which is increasingly important as well. So making it more concrete is step one, I think. Then secondly, and it dovetails nicely with uh, what uh, Mrs. Lindström has said, I think in the, the strategy, uh, the, the EU adaptation strategy, which has now been I would say, implemented at strategic level and planning level in most EU countries. What is often lacking is clear financial planning and financial mechanisms. And I think that is also a prerequisite to make them match with the financial uh, sector. And that, that can be linked to knowledge, not only knowledge that is technical or that is based on environment and climate data, which we provide in our climate adapt but also the knowledge of what is financeable, what is the, the sort of knowledge needed to get public and private money connected to each other, uh, that sort of uh, knowledge. But it also requires, I think, new methodologies in financial institutions, like what type of cost-benefit analysis do you use? What sort of uh, yeah, risk assessment do you uh, use? How do you look over time at these investments? Because some of them are very heavy and front-loaded investment, but then take a long time to deliver. So I think it's also a challenge to financial institutions. And then two last brief points. It's more obvious to understand climate adaptation in what we call green infrastructure, uh, concrete literally then, or building or construction, than in what is now called nature-based solutions. And I think there we really have a challenge. We, we need to be very clear in defining what that means uh, because they are sometimes more complicated and even more expensive. But we know from analyses that they deliver over the longer time more societal benefits, co-benefits, uh, and, and that they have a perspective that uh, is linking other elements of the European agenda, like the biodiversity strategy, the zero pollution strategy, uh, the forest strategy. So 
making that concrete and bankable, investable, I think is another element. So I'll leave it at that for now, but uh, it, this is a great discussion to be had. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hans. Uh, Henk, uh, nice, nice to see you there. And um, I, as the um, International uh, Water Affairs Special Envoy for the Netherlands, um, you have a particular uh, perspective on a hugely important element of the adaptation um, sort of vision. And I wonder if you can uh, tell us a little bit about how the Dutch experience might inform our approach uh, to, a, to a, a challenge that many countries are grappling with, either having too much or having too little water. Thanks very much, uh, Shirin. And thanks also, uh, uh, Mr. Fayol, uh, Ms. Lindstrom, but also Hans Brunig for your uh, introductions and com comments and setting us off. Adaptation is clear. Eh? Paris Agreement said it's two sides of the same coin, but we lag behind around the world. And of course, you could say 1.5 degree is our best adaptation measure, eh? the first. But even with that, uh, extreme events only become more extreme. Uh, and the impact on our economies, societies across the world is also increasing. And that is not a global south problem at all. Eh? We saw last summer. In Germany, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, the impacts of massive rain events uh, on our society with over 200 casualties, and that's unprecedented in the European uh, context. I'd like to refer to the IPCC report from 2019, the Climate Change and Lens Report. And I don't do the report and the uh, scientists right if I summarize it in two points, but this is my short summary of that report. And then one, it says the majority of our investments, uh, close to 99%, is increasing climate change. And the way how we do it, and this leads to adaptation, makes us more vulnerable. And we see it in urbanization. We urbanize faster in the places around the world that are already vulnerable, decreasing by, you know, increasing biodiversity loss, decreasing our natural capital um, uh, decreasing our health opportunity. And we saw it in the last two years with the COVID pandemic, pandemic, how health so much is related to climate and then to water. So I come to my point on water. I'm a water ambassador, so there's, you always have to be a little, little, little bit careful when the water ambassador says, hey, water is your best thing to invest in. But it is true because water is connected to so many of the SDGs. If you invest in water, it trickles down across the full 2030 agenda and helps on mitigation and drives adaptation. It's for better health, more security, economic prosperity, food security, gender equality, opportunities for kids and education, and of course, at the heart of urbanization. We're here at COP. Today is Cities Day. And water cuts across all urban issues. But then if we look on how we invest in water, we lag massively behind. Even the campaign of the last two years of every president and prime minister around the world saying, wash your hands, did not lead to a decrease in vulnerability when it came to wash. So the world really has to step up its game in the context of water, sustainable development and adaptation. And I think we all agree there. Then the question is how to do it. If only a small percentage of the world can be the benchmark, uh, for the better investment. And Hans also uh, talked about nature-based solutions, how hard it is to validate those investments, especially on the short term, while on the long term, those benefits trickle down across societies. Many examples come across uh, where we use water as a leverage uh, for channeling finance, public and private, into opportunities, often ur in an urban context. One example comes from Chennai with the new innovation challenge. Uh, we try to work with communities, government, businesses, and international financiers and came up with a business case for smaller scale community projects with a third less of the investment cost of gray infrastructure and half of the cost in maintenance and operations, while at the same time providing an alternative uh, for uh, carbon intense uh, uh, energy and water production, cutting by that sense uh, the carbon footprint of those communities with 80%. And 
We need those proof of concepts to inform our policies because our policies are yet based on the practices of the past. Eh? And with climate change, we knew we know that that future orientation uh, is going to be of critical importance. Last, uh, the global goal on adaptation is going to be agreed upon, hopefully here in Glasgow, which is now in the draft, uh, gives us a trajectory of two years, two years to get to that global goal on adaptation. In those two years, we have a COP in Egypt. It's going to be a water rich COP. We have the United Nations 2023 UN Conference on Water, the first conference since 1977 at the UN, the second conference in the history of the UN. And the Netherlands is honored to be co-chair together with Tajikistan of that conference as a stepping stone towards the Emirates COP, where we will have to agree on this global goal on adaptation. And we know that goal well, will be totally different than a mitigation goal because adaptation differs across the world in every situation, but it has to be systems-based. It has to be based on understanding the complexity and the interdependencies of our vulnerabilities. And it has to be aimed at the long term, because that is where your values trickle down into the business cases for adaptation. I leave it at this, uh, but I really look forward to also working with the European Environment Asian Agency, Hans, and also with the EIB, of course, as we already do, and help progress in the European Union, help progress our knowledge and capacity on adaptation into systems thinking and action to ensure that it is embedded and mainstreamed in our NDCs in a, a national adaptation plan. For that here at the COP, we agreed on many initiatives uh, with the Adaptation Action Coalition and the Water Adaptation uh, Coalition to mainstream water in our NDCs, in our national adaptation plans as a way to drive adaptation and mitigation. So you can count on the Netherlands for sure uh, uh, on driving adaptation, uh, but also to learn from best practices to be able to scale up and replicate it across the world. Thank you, Shirin. Thank you very much uh, for that, Henk. Uh, very rich contribution, very concrete, and also giving us a bit of a flavor. We might come back and ask you a bit more. We do have people online as well who may want questions. I guess you've got a sense of how things are going, uh, maybe in the negotiation as well, uh, more than some of us in our in our little offices here. Um, but I think very key points, and I wonder maybe if I can just go back to Eva Lindstrom um, first uh, with a couple of questions, if I may. Just keeping on the topic of adaptation, I know your report was a little wider than that, um, but can you just tell us a little more about how you see uh, the EU financing, the EIB as well, on adaptation. Clearly, your report was written before uh, the presentation of the, of the EIB adaptation plan. Uh, but nevertheless, um, even that is a, a set of ideas and intentions uh, rather than actions as yet. Over to you, Eva. And thank you very much, Shireen, and thank you to, to the previous speakers for really, really interesting interventions. And first, a more general comment on sort of our role, and I think also being following what's happening at the COP, I think we have seen a lot of commitments and promises, both when it comes to mitigation and adaptation, but I think our job as auditor is to provide some kind of reality check on what has actually happened uh, concretely uh, on the ground. And I think when it comes to adaptation, I mean, there are at least sort of two problems. I think we have several reports where we have shown that there is a lack of preparedness in member states when we look at specific areas of adaptation, namely flood management and there's a desertification in, in the EU. I think it was also very interesting to hear on sort of practical examples, also good examples from that from, from, for the Netherlands. So I think there is a, a definite need to invest and to find these projects. Um, the second is also what Mr. Uh, Brinnick touched upon that, um, I mean, the, the, the challenge to find a good business model to really make it interesting for private capital. Because when I talked about the investment gap, I think that was, that was to, to clarify and illustrate that EU budget will not be enough 
neither the EIB will be enough, nor the national budget. We need the private and institutional um, investors to sort of come on board. And I think when it comes to mitigation, the pricing of, of, uh, of uh, uh, sort of the, the cost that, that different business have on society. I mean, the emission is, of course, maybe the most obvious one, but, but maybe one should include others. So I think the pricing when it comes to, to, to mitigation, when it comes to adaptation, it is more it is more complicated. And, and as was also said here, that, so that these projects often require large amount of upfront finance, and they also often lack a steady stream of revenue and, and uh, provide sort of non-financial benefits beyond the project. So I think it's difficult to, to find uh, business models. And I, I fully agree with what uh, Mr. Brinick said, said, that we have to be innovative. We have to find how can some of these sort of investment in this assets, how can these assets be bankable? And could one also sort of uh, uh, have, have um, uh, models with, with asymmetric risk taking, for example. I think that is something for, for the EB and other also uh, public institutions to realize. Really elaborate. So I think our role is really, really to, to follow this very closely, to, to have this uh, 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 reality check, and of course also to, to, in our reports, to give recommendations and to keep our stakeholders, the European Parliament and the Council, sort of updated on what is actually happening. But I think also this is a difficult area. Uh, and and also what you said, Shirin, uh, when you when you gave me the floor, this has been a very much of a moving target because I think you can't accuse the Commission for not to taking initiatives. It has been in a lot of initiatives in in, in the last year. But um, on the other hand, I think the problem right now is that climate change is already here, and and. Um, all of the speakers we have all touched upon, I mean, recent event this summer, and now it's happening here, it's happening in Europe. So I think the conclusion is being much, we, we have to invest more, we have to get the private capital to make this interesting, because they're not there because they're good people, they could be good people, but they are there to make money. So we have to find this business model that makes it interesting yeah. for, for Thank for you. Uh, absolutely. Sorry. I mean, I, I, let's home in on this a little. Let me let me ask Vice President Fail first of all, if I may, uh, just to tell us a little bit about, particularly on that um, point that, as um, Eva Lindstrom has just said, this is really complicated. This is not easy. Um, driving the private sector into this is is key. What is the EIB thinking about in this in this sense? Well, I think what uh, what what Ms. Lindstrom just said is is very true. Uh, it is not easy to uh, to find uh, adaptation projects that uh, that involve the private sector, but it's absolutely needed. Um, and if uh, I mean, it is clear that on adaptation, a lot will continue to rely on public money. Uh, that can be for you know for for projects that that fall under. Uh, under, under the, the public sector, uh, obviously, like when you do things on, on flood protection, I mean, this is something that uh, it is, it is uh, not anormal that it is financed with, uh, with, with public uh, or public sector money. Uh, but what we can do to, um, to develop this, I think, is, and, and to get private sector in, uh, is uh, probably a combination of things. Uh, what public development banks do is use public resources to crowding in uh, private resources, to leverage, to de-risk. De-risking is probably a key element if we want to develop, uh, to develop the projects in, uh, in, uh, in adaptation. And, uh, of course, everything we can do to, uh, to help there, we will do. This is part of our strategy, clearly. And there are also projects that, uh, that can bring private sector interest. Uh, let me just give you three examples. I mean, one example was said by Mr. Oving, but clearly uh, on water resources, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that you can find uh, actually interest from the private sector. And if, if it needs to be supported from first-class pieces or, um, 
or resharing from a public institution, that's something that may that may very well make sense. What we can do also, and what we do actually, is a lot of uh, R&D investments, research. I mean, when you look at um, more resilient uh, crops, more resilient seeds, uh, the financing of that uh, is a risky financing. And this is where also an institution like EIB is, uh, is, is helping. And the final, the final example that I would give is everything related to data. I mean, we have signed in uh, in uh, in Glasgow this week. Uh, the president of EIB has signed uh, an MOU with the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Uh, that is clearly an institution that uh, that can help also bring the the data that can be the source of projects uh, that uh, that are presented by by uh, the the private sector. I I will just add two considerations, Shirin. One. It is less and less true that you have mitigation projects on one side and you have adaptation projects on the other. You have more and more adaptation in mitigation projects. And if I, if I can give just one example that we have financed with EAB uh, in Vanuatu, we have financed a wind farm. But Vanuatu is a country where there are more and more cyclones because of climate change. That's adaptation. What we have done is to finance wind, wind turbines that are obviously more expensive, but that are retractable. So when the cyclone comes, you can get them down and you will bring up when the cyclone has passed. This is combination of mitigation, obviously this is a mitigation project, with adaptation. And the last thing that the public institution, and that's my last, last consideration, uh, has to do is how to bring knowledge, how to bring technical assistance, how to bring all the information sharing that is uh, that is uh, relevant to make uh, to make good projects on, on adaptation. And here we are very lucky at the European Investment Bank to have the strong support from uh, especially the government of Germany and Luxembourg. And we have uh, just uh, I'm going to give you. Uh, uh, two, two examples uh, that, that we have actually discussed uh, extensively in, uh, in, in Glasgow. There is the gap fund that is when you work on planning for in developing countries for um, moving cities in, in the way that, uh, that the, the the cities can, uh, the, the city authorities can, can look at the future. It's very complicated because you have energy, transport, water, wastewater. Uh, what we have done is, uh, so this, the, the, this project that, uh, that is close to GAP fund that we implement with uh, the World Bank and with the support from the German authorities and, and the Luxembourg authorities. And that is a, a good combination to allow us to make very early stage planning preparation. And that can include, of course, and that has to include adaptation about well the consequence of climate change that is already there. And one final project that we all, 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 all also uh, finance with uh, with the Luxem support from Luxembourg uh, is the Kraft project that is for climate resilience adaptation projects. That is a private fund, so it's a fund uh, that is financing projects in the adaptation, and it is clearly a private sector fund. But that we support with uh, with our, our our public sector money. Thank you very much, Vice President. Um, I think the gap fund as well, uh, to some extent, speaks to that point, doesn't it? In the in the auditor's report um, around upstream engagement and 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 also this the importance not just of the money but of the the technical assistance and the advice early on. Um, Getting a little deeper into some of the points that were brought up there, um, data, I think, maybe I can ask you a bit about that, Hans. Um, I mean, that's that's important, isn't it? Also in the context of uh, getting the private sector on board, um, more transparency, more data, more universally shared, and the auditor's report and, and uh, Eva Lindstrom talked about the taxonomy a little bit in this regard. Give us your take on that and, and the way in which the 
uh, environment agency is contributing to uh, adaptation data, including in, in the context of the, of the uh, Climate Adapt platform, if you would. Yes, uh, I would be happy to. This, of course, dovetails nicely with one of the three pillars of the EU adaptation strategy, which is smarter adaptation. And one part of that smarter is indeed to build a knowledge base, which uh, I think caters to different scales, because adaptation takes place at a variety of scales. It can be very micro, it can be the urban scale, it can be regional, national, and what we should not forget, cross-national. I mean, coastal Coastline uh, protection, for example, doesn't stop at the border between Belgium and the Netherlands or the Netherlands and Germany. So that dimension is often lacking still, huh? uh, to be quite frank. Uh, so that type of scalable information on elements that are important to uh, check the feasibility of projects. And for example, Copernicus data can be of, of use there. Technical data can be of use there. Also, uh, data that looks at risk assessments, and uh, Mr. Fayol talked about the uh, uh, ECMWF partnership. Uh, there are, of course, a number of organizations that produce data that is already used, for example, by the reinsurance. Shirin, are you still with us? Hi, I think we just got disconnected from Glasgow briefly. <laughs> both, uh, oh, both oh that was unfortunate. Yeah, yeah so, so just pick up again, Hans. Yeah, sorry, I don't know where I where you lost me, but uh, the, the Climate Adapt platform brings together knowledge that is science-based and that can be used for risk assessment, due diligence, also forward-looking methods, because I think Climate adaptation should not only be reactive. After something has happened, we're now going, no, it could be proactive and much more preventative as well. You need spe specific information for that. We also look at data that is connected to policy uh, making and where people can be inspired also by, by what others are doing. And increasingly, we are also making connections to uh, I would say a networked approach to producing that data. For example, our platform on climate and health uh, related data, which we do with uh, ECMWF and the, uh, with, uh, I mean, ECDC, the European Commission that is involved. So it is really a body of knowledge that is quickly developing and rightly so, and that we now need to connect to those actors who can translate that body of knowledge in their particular context to stimulate uh, the types of investments and, and projects that are needed. Where I would also like to put the emphasis is that the other, one of the other elements of the strategy is to do it faster. Uh, in general, I think uh, this COP and science is telling us that it's not only about scaling up, but increasingly also about speeding up responses. So how we can Im increase the speed of uh, adaptation measures would be good. And um, maybe one final out-of-the-box thought. Uh, if we could think of climate adaptation measures as a sort of insurance policy to protect other assets, that would open up a rather different debate. Because you could say, yes, of course, we will fund your big project. But you also need to invest in the adaptation side because at the end, that is our best uh, insurance that whatever could go wrong, we have taken that into account. But that requires a different model of thinking about co-investments. Eh? We know that when you do urban investments and the big, the big developing companies of apartments and houses, we tell them you need to invest in the infrastructure for transport or you need to invest in the schools or the other infrastructure. Could we start to think of adaptation as an insurance of the core assets that we still continue to invest in. That might be an interesting uh, pathway also. Okay. 
I might I might ask the vice president to come back on that point in a moment because I think that's something the EIB is very much uh, um, involved in. But let me first um, go to Hank um, uh, for some thoughts really about what you've heard, Hank, um, but also uh, perhaps also picking up uh, some of the ideas that um, Vice President Fayol mentioned in terms of the the innovative models that are out there, particularly um, for the private sector to jump uh, in on uh, when it comes to water, combining adaptation and mitigation. But if I can add another question, if I may, to that, um, we've seen the adaptation strategy from the European Commission, um, the European Union earlier in the year. Do you see enough blue in that uh, in that plan? Um, do you think that we need to work harder to get more blue in future adaptation plans? And if so, how do we do it? Bearing in mind Hans's point, urgency. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Sharon. Um, and to start with your last point, um, it's a green deal, but um, um, it should have been a green and blue deal, of course. Uh, and and exactly to the point of Hans, um, and I, it's point I made earlier, invest in water, uh, help scale, but also speed up adaptation and mitigation projects. Um, and to the concept of de-risking uh, and the conversation we also had here at the COP, uh, with the insurers and assurers, uh, invest in water, nature-based solutions, and resiliency and adaptation measures, uh, not only de-risks de and prevents losses, but also helps create added value. Uh, and I think the systems approach uh, is there of critical importance. Yeah? And I totally agree with uh, Vice President Fayol is that um, mitigation and adaptation are becoming one of the same kind in these more systemic approaches. Our world, we organize the world nicely in silos. Uh, and we think with those siloed approaches, we can solve the challenges we faced. In the past, it was a bit true. Eh? You thought there was a problem and you identified it as a single uh, a challenge and you addressed that problem with a single focused solution. But more and more because the, you know, the, the stacking of our challenges, urbanization, population growth and economic needs uh, across the world, we now understand that those problems actually were not so simple. They were complex, yeah, they were wicked. And to address them, you also have to deal them, deal with them in their full complexity at their full scale across disciplines, across sectors, across sex challenges, but also across scales. Uh, yeah. You can't solve a challenge of water and adaptation only at the local scale. You have to understand that system scale. And then I go back to uh, uh, what's already been mentioned. There are three things important. Eh? We have to understand this and dare to understand that complexity and not shy away from it because it is our best opportunity in the context of climate action. But we're a little bit afraid of that sometimes because uh, the issue of cli addressing climate and looking then beyond only infrastructure measures shies us away from single-focused and short-term solutions. But understanding that complexity, combined with the second point, being able to value that, not only from a financial economic point of view, but a broader societal, economic, environmental, cultural perspective, makes it possible to also come up with opportunities, business cases and the like, where public and private can work together, all in their different roles, in scale of finance, in the role of financiers from de-risking or uh, financing innovations that are, you know, the, the most riskiest but will drive that scale and speed up of ad adaptation so critical and important. And then to my last third point, eh, understand value is management, the governance. Um, in the current context, we too often relate to the existing frameworks we have. While we know that uh, to be able to scale and speed up adaptation measures, we have to create more room. Uh, a lot of research being done, also in the context of the European Union, uh, we call it create more soft space, uh, a little bit of wiggle room to escape uh, the, the borders and boundaries that we create with our policies and governance models of the past, to be able to innovate, speed and scale up, uh, and jumpstart to that future. 
And that, I think, European Union has amazing mechanisms for that. These cross-sectoral partnerships, public and private, informal and formal, where innovations are, are the, the drivers for that change. And, of course, in my role as a water ambassador for the Netherlands in working around the world, we use water and climate challenges as the opportunity to create that space, to build trust across society and based on those partnerships, be able to present business cases for the short and the long term for public and private. So I see many opportunities in that, but it also demands guts sometimes on the level of government. Don't be afraid to, you know, to experiment and fail. Use exactly that combination of public private finance and non-finance to ensure that that environment of uh, innovation is indeed the environment where we well, reinvent the future based on the, the, the that, that complexity uh, uh, understanding the valuing and management. So management and governance also is about accountability and transparency, data and so forth. But it's also about novel models of collaboration from the ground up. So I'll leave you with that. Well, to, to your first, your last question, which was almost also your first point, and bluing the Green Deal and turning green pipelines into green blue pipelines, of course, again, your best investment opportunity to secure mitigation and adaptation measures in Europe and beyond. Thank you very much, Henk. Um, and, uh, just before we go, I'd like, I think we've got a, a little bit of time. Maybe if I can come back to uh, the three of you um, ju the, just to, for a final point on this. Um, Henk reminded us that next year the COP will be uh, in Egypt and it will be a COP, uh, probably very vacation theme will be high on the agenda. Um, We've had the global goals on adaptation here at the COP. We've seen institutions like the EIB announcing um, greater ambition on adaptation. But how, maybe I can ask each of you, how optimistic are you actually? Um, Ava, maybe I'll start with you, that if you were to write another report, um, maybe in six months' time, you might actually be coming up with some slightly less um, critical conclusions. Well, I guess as auditors, we are sort of paid to be a bit pessimistic, but I can assure you that this is something that we will follow very, very closely. Just a few comments also what, on what have been said. I think what, what uh, you said, Hans, on, on this sort of um, uh, insurance approach, I think that's really sort of interesting to, to have that sort of proactive uh, approach. And I think that is also what sustainability is really about, to be prepared and then to, to, to also have a good thinking and innovate on how can we share risks and how can we distribute risks um, between different areas and also between maybe uh, 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 different, different sectors. I think secondly, also what you raised, Hank, that sort of investing in water has such many interlinkage with others. And I think that is really what the Agenda 2030 is also about, that everything is sort of interlinked. And I think also for us uh, as auditors to check on the, the coherence, that is really important. We're slightly not... struggling with your connection there, Eva. I don't know okay. if it's my end or your end. I was just saying that that uh, what Hank touched upon, that so many things are inter. Inter interlinked. I think that is an important role also for us auditors to check on the coherent. And that brings me back also to the sort of the other part of our report, because I think today we have discussed a very important role on the EIB, and I think there's a lot of interesting initiatives ongoing. But let us not forget the next generation EU. I mean, we have 750 billion euros that will be invested. And how can these money be used in, in a sort of a uh, no significant harm principle, at least, but also be part of the sort of adaptation um, process? So I hope well, I will have a, a, a positive uh, uh, review, but I can assure you that at least we will follow this very closely. So thank you very much. Thank you very 
much. I think it's hugely important, uh, and as we said at the beginning, that the adaptation agenda is on uh, not just the obvious factors um, radar, but but everyone because it's so important. Um, Vice President Fayol, we're struggling a little with our technicals here, but uh, I wonder if uh, you can that. offer us a yeah. few words on. Yeah, actually, uh, a few words, I, I, uh, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that's. Um, I mean, I I agree very much with uh, with what uh, Ms. Lindstrom just just said, uh, and what uh, what Hank also uh, uh, Hank Oling made as, as as a point. I am um, I am I am optimistic. I I we have met in uh, in Glasgow with the Minister of uh, International uh, Development of Egypt. It's clearly. Uh, High on the agenda of the of the Egyptian uh, strategy for for climate, uh, and that will be high on the agenda for the next uh, years anyway. And this this issue, the two things that I would like to to say, if we want to be successful, we need two things. We need indeed to develop partnerships with institutions that are extremely uh, important in working on resilience. And we don't have necessarily enough links with them. And I'm particular, particularly thinking of uh, the, the reinsurers here. Yeah. These are people who are dealing with risk, with uh, climate risk, with um, uh, and, and actually they are working a lot on adaptation. And that's something where we need to find the connection better. And the second thing is we need to definitely make sure that we can have uh, a, a better link between mitigation and adaptation as a fluid way to look at projects, not as a way that uh, adaptation comes either completely separately or it comes at the end. Or you know, We need to make this connection quite fluid. And that's that's what we are going to work on, actually, in implementing our adaptation strategy at the, at the, at the bank. You are muted, Chair. Thank you very much. Sorry, we're struggling a little with our with our mute. I'm going to uh, ask um, Hans actually just to finish off by answering uh, a question actually from our um, online audience, which is how do adaptation strategies ensure that they are both bottom up and top down, so they're inclusive, resilient and can generate long-term impact, especially in more fragile countries. What are the multi-stakeholder fora that you see as relevant? Um, and you're answering for all of, uh, all of the, the, the panel, if you don't mind, Hans, because we're going to uh, wrap up after that. Over to you. Okay, I will be extremely brief. First of all, I think it refers to the governance of adaptation measures, which should be inclusive. And I think the best stakeholder forum is the one that is adapted and adjusted and inclusive for the particular purpose of that adaptation intervention, because it, it is across scales and it involves a variety of actors. So get the right people involved at the right level and at the right time. And that means early on, it's not enough to communicate to stakeholders involve them early on that is clear it also in my reading refers to not only fragile countries but also fragile communities and i think the vulnerability debate is not limited only to uh, vulnerability uh, compared between countries or vulnerability the wealthy countries and the developing countries also in european cities and regions there are reasons to include uh, the social dimension, the distribution dimension, the vulnerability dimension, much more uh, informed and structurally in our responses to climate change. So we do quite a bit of work on that. Uh, I'm happy to connect to the uh, person who asked the question, but I think it's a critical element of the way forward. Hans, I think you're on mute now. Yes, because I, I finished my response. So. <laughs> okay, fine. We've got a time delay here. We'll 
Look, thank you so much to um, to the listener, the viewer who uh, posed that last question because it's absolutely essential. We're we're not going to get anywhere unless we have a genuinely inclusive process and, of course, a just transition. Um, I'm hoping that our technical problems here in Glasgow are due to the fact that people are tweeting madly that we're getting a breakthrough on the talks. Um, let's hope. Uh, we're in the final stretch here at COP26. Um, but before we go to find out what's going on, in fact, uh, maybe Hank can tell us, I'm going to say thank you very much to all of you who joined us online. But a uh, special thanks to our panelists, to uh, Eva Lindstrom from the European Court of Auditors, um, to uh, Hans Brönig from the European Environment Agency, to Amboise Fayol, European Investment Bank Vice President, and to Hank Ovink. Special Envoy for International Water Affairs for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And we look forward to gathering again next year, certainly before on uh, the hard work, but at least publicly next year to report back, not just to the court of auditors, but to the public on what we've been doing. Thank you very much, all of you. See you.